We come this morning to the end of our short series in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel and the, the lion's den. And this morning we are looking at the closing verses of the chapter, Daniel chapter 6 from verse 25 down to the end, verses 25 to 28. Who do we take most notice of in our lives? And who should we take most notice of in our lives? Whose words and whose actions matter most? Who do we listen to? These are important questions, aren't they? Because if we take notice of and listen to the, the wrong people, then we are, we are likely to go astray. You, you remember how the, the Lord Jesus once spoke about the blind leading the blind. And when that happens, they all fall into a ditch. And we come this morning to the end of Daniel chapter 6. Who, who do we take most notice of it in this chapter? Who are we to learn about and learn from in, in this chapter? Who, who has the most important place in, in this chapter? Who, who is Daniel chapter 6 all about? I suppose there are four possible answers to those questions. We could say, we, we probably wouldn't say this, but we, we could say, well, Daniel chapter 6, the, the, the people we notice most in Daniel chapter 6, the, the people we, we can really learn from in Daniel chapter 6 and learn about are, are Daniel's enemies. These, these men who plotted together against Daniel to, to bring him down and to destroy him, but who themselves in the end were destroyed as a result of what they did. There are lessons we can learn from Daniel chapter 6 about the, the enemies of the gospel and how the enemies of the gospel think and, and how they work and how everything will ultimately end for them. And that's true. There are lessons we can learn from Daniel's enemies in this chapter. But, but they don't have the most important place in the chapter. We, we could say, well, perhaps it's King Darius. Perhaps King Darius is the one that we, we really learn from in this chapter. This king, this mighty man, Darius the Mede, who now ruled over what had been the, the Babylonian Empire, who had great authority and power. This king who highly respected Daniel and wanted to, to rescue Daniel when he was in danger but was unable to do so. There are many lessons we can learn from King Darius, lessons we learn about the powers and authorities in the world today and how limited their, their power and authority ultimately is. And that's certainly true, that there are many lessons we can learn from King Darius in this chapter, but, but King Darius does not have the most important place in the chapter. We could, of course, say that the, the most important figure in this chapter is, is Daniel. Daniel, the, the man of God. Daniel, the, this man who served God continually. This man who stood firm. This man who obeyed God rather than man. This man who prayed and was faithful to God even to the point of being thrown to the lions. And yes, there are certainly many, many lessons we can learn from Daniel in this chapter. And we've, we've tried to learn some of them over recent weeks. But, but even Daniel is not the most important figure in this chapter. Even Daniel does not have the most important place. Even Daniel is not the one we are to, to notice most in this chapter. Fourth possibility, 
and the one who this chapter really is all about. And the one whom we get to notice most in this chapter and learn of most in this chapter is Daniel's God. Daniel's God. Daniel chapter 6 is all about Daniel's God. He is the most important figure in the chapter. He is the one that we are to learn from most. Uh, and this chapter ends by, by lifting up Daniel's God before us. He, verse 26, is the living God. And he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens on the, and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. great purpose of this chapter is to show us the greatness and the glory of God. Now these words at the end of the chapter are the words of King Darius in response to what God did in saving Daniel from the lions. And we do not know whether or not King Darius himself really Believe these things that he said. We, we, we do not know whether or not King Darius became a, a true believer in the true God. But he did speak these true words about God that are recorded here in the Bible for, for our learning. And they tell us things that we need to know about Daniel's God and about our God. And so the first thing we, we see in these words at the end of the chapter is that Daniel's God is the living God. Verse 26, King Darius says that he is the living God and he endures forever. Daniel, as we've seen over recent weeks, spent 70 years in Babylon, a place of many gods, a place of many idols, but Daniel never forgot that he belonged to the God of Israel. He belonged to the, the living God. In Psalm 135, the living God is contrasted with the, the gods of, of this world. Psalm 135, verse 13, your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, through all generations. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Daniel knew and loved and served the living God. And the events of this chapter had shown King Darius that Daniel knew and loved and served the living God. King Darius saw how Daniel served the, the, the living God in, in his workplace. At the beginning of the chapter, in, in verse 4, we read of how Daniel was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. King Darius saw the way that, that Daniel prayed to his God, the, the living God. When this law was passed that no one was to pray to anyone other than the king for, for 30 days. Daniel in verse 10 went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. And three day, times a day he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. King Darius saw that though Daniel was loyal to him, when it came to the crunch... Daniel would obey and pray to his God rather than obey and pray to the king. King Darius saw that Daniel's God was stronger than the lions and protected Daniel from the lions. As we saw last week in verse 23, that when Daniel was lifted from the lion's den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. King Darius saw all of this. 
And he was driven then to, to this conclusion that he states in verse 26 that the God of Daniel is the living God and he endures forever. Now how much Darius understood of what he said, we don't know. But what he said is in line with what God says about himself elsewhere in the scriptures. For example, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10 and verse 10, we are told that the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. Or a verse from the New Testament when Paul and, and Barnabas were in the city of Lystra in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15. They said to the people, we are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. God is the, the living God. He has no beginning. There was never a time when God began to live because he has always lived. And there will never be a time when God ceases to live. He's without beginning and without end. The, the, the living God always has been, always will be the, the living God. And Darius says he's the living God and he endures forever. And we have been made to know and to worship and to enjoy the living God. True life is to know and worship and enjoy the living God. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He prayed to his father and said, this is life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And that the call of the gospel, as we've just seen in Acts chapter 14, that the call of repentance is the call for you to turn from your idols, to, to turn from the other gods of your life, whatever they may be, and to turn to the living God. Paul wrote about the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and, and verse 9 that they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. At the heart of this chapter, there was a great battle. Daniel faced a great battle. Who would he pray to? This law was made. No one was to pray to anyone other than King Darius for 30 days. Who, who was Daniel going to pray to? Was he going to pray to King Darius, this mere man? Or was he going to pray to the living God? And, and all of us face that same battle. Who are we going to pray to? Who are we going to turn to for help? Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to look to for salvation? Who are we going to look to for life and, and for purpose and, and for meaning? Who are we going to look to for peace and for forgiveness? Who, who are you looking to this morning? Who, who, who or what is your, your God this morning? Are you looking for these things to the, the gods of money and health and comfort and entertainment or, or whatever other things they may be? We can make a God of, of just about anything. Or do you look to the living God? In the, in the book of Isaiah, a great call goes out for, from God for, for people to, to look to him, to, to turn from their idols and, and believe in him. Isaiah chapter 45 and 
Verse 20 says, ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who, who pray to gods that cannot save. There is no God apart from me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. And how do we know that the God of the Bible is the living God, the only true and, and living God? Well, King Darius knew that Daniel's God was the living God because of what he did. He, he delivered Daniel from the lions. And we know that God is the living God because of what he has done. Because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live and die and rise again to save sinners. Daniel's God is the living God. But we also see in these words of King Darius that the Daniel's God is the king of kings. Still in verse 26, the God of Daniel is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Daniel served God for 70 years in Babylon under four different kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. And these kings were powerful leaders who had great wealth and some of them had won great victories. But all four of them came and they went. <laughs> that happened just in Daniel's lifetime. They, they, they came and they went. They, they lived, they reigned, they died. And they were soon forgotten. And so it is with all kings and rulers and presidents and prime ministers. They come and they go. But King Darius said of Daniel's God, his kingdom will never be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Earlier on in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar said something very similar about Daniel's God. Chapter 4 and verse 3, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His dominion is an eternal kingdom. His, sorry, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Chapter 4 and verse 34. I praise the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? And these great kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, they, they, they were forced to admit that there, there's a greater king who has a greater kingdom. When Daniel was a, a much younger man, he was brought before King Nebuchadnezzar to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar a dream that the king had had. It was a dream of a huge statue in the, the form of the, the body of a man. Uh, and different parts of the statue were made of different materials. And then a, a stone, a rock came. And it smashed into the statue and destroyed it. And then that stone, that rock itself, became a mountain that, that filled the whole earth. And Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar the dream. The statue, made up of different materials, represented the Babylonian Empire and other empires that would follow. And they would all eventually come tumbling down. But the rock, the stone, that became a mountain and filled the whole earth, is, is the kingdom of God. 
the kingdom of God that will last forever. Daniel said in chapter 2 and verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Daniel showed that that God had promised to set up a kingdom, to set up a kingdom in the world that will never end. Then, around 500 years later, God's Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world. And when he began his ministry, he said this, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of God has arrived. God has set up a kingdom in this world and and Jesus Christ is, is the king who rules over it. And it's made up of all of those people all over the world who who take Jesus Christ as their saviour and who submit to him as their king. And this kingdom has spread. And it, it continues to spread all over the world. It's like a mountain that fills the whole earth. It's like a mustard seed that becomes a great tree. Another kingdom's karma, another kingdom's go. But this kingdom, the kingdom of God, it it continues. And it will endure forever. When this world is no more. When the kingdoms of this world are no more. The kingdom of God will endure. The the kingdom of God will continue forever in a, a new world where Jesus Christ the King will will reign and rule with his people. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So Daniel's God... Is the living God. Daniel's God is the King of Kings. Thirdly, we see here that that Daniel's God is the God of salvation. Daniel's God rescues and saves. King Darius says of the God of Daniel in verse 27, He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So so King Darius had seen this with his own eyes. He'd seen a mighty work of salvation that, that God had done. King Darius saw Daniel go into the lion's den. And the next morning, King Darius saw Daniel come out of the lion's den untouched, unharmed. King Darius heard Daniel say in verse 22, My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. What an amazing rescue that was. What an amazing salvation it was. What kind of God is this? What what kind of God is the the God of Daniel? Well, Darius says he is one who rescues and saves and performs wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And just think of it. King Darius said this on the basis of seeing God rescue one man, one night. Daniel could have told King Darius, and maybe he did, of a night when God rescued all of the Israelites, thousands upon thousands of them, from slavery and misery in Egypt. And Daniel could have told King Darius, and maybe he did, 
that God had made a promise to send a saviour to the world who would rescue people from all nations of the world. Who would rescue a great multitude of people from all nations that no one can count. Saviour who would rescue people from their sin and the punishment of their sin, the, the just and holy wrath of God that, that sin deserves. God has kept that promise, the, the promise that Daniel believed, the promise that Daniel looked forward to. And he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world as a man to, to, to live and to die on the cross and to rise again. And all who truly believed in him, believe in him are saved. God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if on the basis of seeing God save one man one night, King Darius said, he rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens on the earth. How much more? Should we honour and glorify this God when he saved not just one man one night, but he saved a vast multitude of people that cannot be counted in all places at all times. So Daniel's God is the, the living God and Daniel's God is, is the, the, the king of kings and Daniel's God rescues and saves Let's think about something else. Let's think then about Daniel's God and us. Daniel's God and us. How, how do we respond to the God of Daniel? How do we respond to the God we read of here in, in chapter 6 and who is described to us in these, these closing verses? Well, King Darius made a decree, a law, another one. And he made a decree... The people in his kingdom must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Verse 25, in the first part of verse 26, King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Well, perhaps... King Darius meant well, but there's a, a basic flaw to his plan, isn't there? There's a, a, a very obvious problem with, with this. The problem is simply that governments cannot do this. Laws simply cannot make people truly worship God. You know, if you've ever had a damp problem in your house, you know, the, those black spots that appear on the wall and you, you get out the paint and you paint over it. But that doesn't solve the problem, does it? Just painting over the spots doesn't solve the problem. They, they just come back a, a few weeks later. And uh, King Darius trying to make a law to, to make people worship and, 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 and fear and honour the God of Daniel. Oh, it's like just painting over the spots. The, 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 the idols of their hearts would, would, would soon come back. A government cannot make people honour and worship God from the heart simply by passing a law. Only God himself can do that. And God calls upon people to do that. God does call upon us to do what Darius called upon his people to do in verse 26. God calls upon us to fear and reverence him. Books of Psalms and Proverbs tell us that the fear of God is the beginning 
of wisdom. We, we sang earlier Psalm 111. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. Book of Proverbs, chapter 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And in the books of Psalms and Proverbs, that the wise are, are the saved. The wise are the, the people of God. The, the, the wise are believers, Christians. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There is no salvation without the fear of God. Nobody is saved without the fear of God. But what actually is the fear of God? What does it mean? I was helped a few years ago reading a book by American preacher Al Martin on on this subject, the subject of the fear of God. And he argues from the scriptures that there are basically three parts to the fear of God. First of all, to understand the character of God. To fear God is to see who God is, to see that God is holy, that he is pure, that we are sinful and can only be made right with God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the first part of what it means to fear God, to see who God is, to see what God is like, that he is holy. And then the second part of the fear of God is to have a sense of the presence of God. To fear God is to remember that he is the living God and, and he is there. He's always there. Present at all times. Present in our most secret moments. Observing our most secret thoughts. He's present and sees all we, we do and say and think. And then the third strand to the fear of God is to be aware of our obligations to God, to be aware of what God requires of us. To, to fear God is to realize that we are to love him above all of us. That we are to obey him in all things. That we are to trust him at all times. Verse 26 says that people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Daniel lived in the fear of God in Babylon. And the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. And the Son of God came into the world as a man. He lived in the fear of God. Great promise was made about his coming in Isaiah chapter 11. It says in verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. May we then, with God's help, live in the fear of the Lord in this place and at this time.